Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to take a look at this little thing right here, which is the Odroid H2 Plus. But we're not just going to look at the H2 Plus. Instead, we're going to look at that with the H2 LAN card because there's a network adapter that goes directly on this card, and it gives it a pretty interesting feature. On this system, we get two standard 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports, but then with the expansion card, we get four more two and a half gig ethernet ports for a total of six two and a half gig ethernet ports on the entire little system here. Now I could go out and tell you that this thing is extremely inexpensive and in some ways it kind of is. The board itself, the Odroid H2 Plus is $119 if you order it online. And then the card is about $47. So, you know, for something that is in the, I don't know, $166 range, this is actually a pretty interesting platform. At the same time, that $166 only includes the board and the network adapter. It does, and that also has, I guess, the processor on it as well and the you know, battery, but it doesn't necessarily come with everything you need to really get running with the system. So the actual costs are probably more in the maybe 225 to 200 and maybe 50, $265 range. We're gonna talk a little bit about how these things are optioned and what some of the options are as well in this review. When I first saw the system, I was really excited. It had two two and a half gig ethernet ports and I thought, hey, that's a great little single board computer and it's relatively inexpensive. So I definitely want one of those. And I kind of put that project on the back burner for a little while. And then I finally ordered one when I got reminded that there is this new four port LAN card. After this unit right here arrived, I noticed a couple things. First off, the, some of those options are actually really interesting. Second, there are definitely some drawbacks with this solution, and we're going to talk about those. But overall, I definitely thought that it was a pretty good value. And so that's why you're going to see one on one of the most expensive, you know, I guess stands that you could have for computer products over here, which is the Canon C200. And then another one over here, which you might notice is actually on a tiny mini micro node, followed by the Lenovo M90N IoT, which is actually kind of a competitor to this. So in this video, we're going to go over all these kind of features, and then we'll talk a little bit about performance. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about all the OS testing we did, because that was a really interesting part. And then we'll talk a little bit about power consumption and conclude with some of my final thoughts and why I originally purchased one unit, but now I have three. Just so you know, we're also going to get to what the heck this thing in the middle here is, because it's also one of my least favorite things of this whole setup. And full disclosure, how we got these units was that we purchased them. They were not sent to us. And if you want to know how we're paying for that, we're basically selling merch like these awesome sweatshirts that you can find on our Teespring shop linked in the description. All right, so let's start with the board itself. On one side, we have the audio jack. So you get two audio jacks. You also get an optical audio out. So if you need an optical audio out from your single board computer, you can totally do that with this one. You then have a display port, which is a display port 1.2 port, as well as an HDMI 2 port. These are 4K60 capable. So if you do want to use this as a low power desktop type of application, you completely can do that. And you can actually run two 4K displays directly from this unit. Next to that, we have two IO blocks, and you're going to see we have four USB ports. Two of those are USB 3, and they're really Gen 1, so 5 gigabit per second ports. Two of them are USB 2 ports. It's kind of a bummer that we don't get a Gen 2, but just based on the platform, that is what it is. Above those, you're going to see the two RJ45 ports, and those two RJ45 ports are 2.5 gig Realtek NICs, and that's actually an upgrade from the previous generation. The previous generation had two one gig NICs, but when they did the refresh of this platform from the H2 to the H2 Plus, that was one of the big upgrades. And finally, on the edge, you're going to see a DC power jack. This takes a pretty standard 15 volt power, you know, DC power thing. So you just need a power adapter. This system does not come with a power adapter, so you need to purchase one of those separately. From, I think, like uh, Hard Kernel, they were like $9.40 or something like that. Ameridroid's a little bit more, but overall, you know, you can figure 10 to $15 or so for a power supply. Looking at the unit itself, you're probably wondering what this giant heatsink is, and that is an Intel Celeron J4115 processor. You may hear me say it's either an Atom processor or it's the Gemini Lake Refresh processor. Those are basically the same thing. It's just these are Intel marketing names. And so that's what it is. This is an Atom product. It's a four core product. There's four megabytes of cache. And you get clock speeds, I think, started about 1.8 gigahertz and will go into about 2.3 all core. The TDP on this is 10 watts. This entire board will use more than that, but it's not too bad. 
So probably the next most interesting part of this is I guess this little battery, I put the battery inside this heat sink and just kind of stuck it in there. Basically the battery is more or less, there's like a battery with some wires and then it's like, there's some heat shrink wrap and that's what they all look like. Got it from the, you know, hard kernel folks. We got it from Meridroid. We got extra batteries, not just the ones that came with this. And they all basically look like that. These are, I kind of wish that that was not uh, on this wire system. And there's actually like a formal header that was on the motherboard. They even have vertical ones that would be really cool. And the reason for that is just if I'm holding this and I'm like swinging around and it's not stuck in this heatsink, it the battery goes and will floop around to hit the heatsink fins and it sounds like a wind chime. You may see when you go purchase these that there is an option to get another one of these batteries, but these units do come with the battery. I didn't know that. So I ended up with a couple extras. You might be wondering what these ports are on the top. Well, there are actually two SATA three ports that are up here, and then you get two power ports. And I stuck them on a, you know, two and a half inch drive. And you can basically see that you get a basic, you know, SATA port, and then you get a custom, you know, little power connector. And you can basically put two drives and also give them power off of the board itself, which is actually kind of nice, especially if you're using inexpensive cases. If you just have a DC power brick, you don't necessarily have a way to power drives because you don't have the normal Molex or, you know, SATA power connectors coming off of your power supply. So this is actually a nice little solution. Just below that, and you're going to see that we have this all configured just because I thought it was a little bit more interesting. Uh, you see that there's a little EMMC thing here. This is a 64 gig module here. This does not come with an EMMC module. So this is something that you have to purchase separately. You can go and get something like an 8 gig module. And if you're just running, you know, maybe an embedded application, like a firewall or something like that. That's probably eight or 16 gigs is fine. It's not too expensive. It goes around the motherboard and it does not take up one of your SATA slots, which is really important when you only have two. On the front of the board, we actually get power switch as well as a reset switch. These are physical switches. Actually, I've ended up using these quite a bit, so I'm pretty happy that they're there. Something that is a little bit more challenging is that once this is in a case, you don't have access to these. So you're going to need to go buy a power reset switch if you don't get one with your chassis. On the top, what you're going to see is we get our IO pins here. And then what was also kind of interesting is we get this little header here. And what this little header is, is a custom four pin fan header. So this is the 92 millimeter fan that you can get from the Odroid folks. And it comes with this, you know, the right header to be able to go plug in here. Frankly, you kind of need a fan. If you're going to be running this thing under really heavy loads, I would definitely recommend a fan. But if you're going to be running this thing mostly idle and you have something that is a pretty low CPU utilization task, you can actually get away without a fan. I mean, this thing was actually sitting idle probably had 5% CPU utilization, just running a couple of VMs for about two days. And it had no problems. And I can actually touch the heatsink. It's definitely a warm heatsink afterwards. Like, don't get me wrong there, but you could touch the heatsink and it wasn't too, too bad. So I would say you don't necessarily need a fan, but I think that if you are going to run stuff that's, you know, kind of like a heavier compute workload, you're going to want the fan. And this is a couple dollars. So I would just get one if I were purchasing this just to be safe. Frankly, if you end up needing a fan after it's going to cost you more in shipping than it is just to go buy the thing up front. Now, looking at the bottom of this unit, what you can see is something that's really kind of cool, which is that you get two DDR4 SODIM slots. And in those SODIM slots, you could put a low memory configuration, like you could put, say, a single four gig DIM, but you can also scale up and you could put, say, two 16 gig DIMs and put 32 gigs of memory in this little platform. I don't necessarily know how many people are going to need 32 gigs of memory with a four core, basically Atom processor. I don't necessarily think that you know there's going to be a lot of people like that. So what we've been doing is generally putting somewhere between eight and 16 gigs into SODIM configurations into here. So that gives us you know enough memory if we want to run a desktop, if we want to run a little virtualization node or whatever. Realistically, that's a pretty good, I think, amount of RAM for a system like that. Now, the other feature that these have is they actually have a M.2 slot on the bottom of these motherboards. This M.2 slot is a little bit different than what you might expect if you're accustomed to a normal desktop that you see today. This is not PCIe Gen 4, and it's also not PCIe Gen 3. This is still a PCIe Gen 2 slot. It still means that you can get something that is faster than SATA to work on a system like this, but at the same time, you're not going to get full PCIe Gen 3 speeds or Gen 4 speeds. So I would not put like a PCIe Gen 4 SSD in here because there's just absolutely no point. And frankly, those also run, the controllers run pretty hot there. So I wouldn't necessarily want to go do that anyway. But that brings me to what might be the biggest innovation that really brought me to this platform, which is this card right here, which is the H2 network card. Now this actually slots into the M.2 slot. You can see that right here. And it's a custom form factor, I guess, NIC that has four different Realtek RTL 81 
25 B NICs. And those are the same NICs actually that are on the H2 pluses, you know, NICs up here. So you get a total of six of those NICs. And I actually really like this. The price for this, the list price I think is like $47. If you get it from Meridroid, I think it's something like $59. And the reason I purchase a lot of stuff from Meridroid is just frankly, it takes a day. I can get any method of shipping and it basically takes a day for it to get here since they're based in California as well. And so I'm just kind of using that also as another price reference point. I know there are other sellers out there, but that's the one I've been using. So realistically, people will say this is a $119 board. It is kind of, but it's not really a $119 system. You need to put other stuff around it. You need the power supply. You probably want to get a fan, even if you're not going to use it immediately because you might need it at some point. You also need some kind of storage, whether that's a SATA device or an EMMC device, and you're probably going to want to put RAM in it as well. And if you're going to want that network card, you're going to have to go buy that as well. And then that kind of brings this total package together. I think that our you know, kind of pricing on these things was closer to about $235, $245, but fully optioned out. I think it was probably closer to a little bit like $260 once we got into the cases. This is one of those cases, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about the net card. So having the extra four Realtek NICs is, I guess, awesome. Just the fact that something like this has six two and a half gig Ethernet NICs is, I think, phenomenal. I mean, frankly, you can't even get a two and a half gig six port you know, switch in this price range these days, which is completely mind blowing to me. And I really hope that some of the vendors are watching this and actually go put out two and a half gig switches because you know, at the end of the day, it is really just nice to have a little bit faster than one gig speeds. There are a couple little oddities to it. And so if you look at these and you look at this, there's actually a difference in the BIOS that you have to use. Because if you do put the four port NIC on there, you need to take that M.2 slot, which is a PCIe Gen 2 by four slot, and you need to bifurcate those by four lanes into four separate by one lanes. Each one of those by one lanes goes to a Realtek controller. And that's how this whole thing is put together. There's no PCIe switch on here. And so these things are really all taking separate paths from the NICs to the SOC. Now on a normal consumer motherboard, what you might expect is just you'd have the ability to go in and, you know, there's a little bio setting and people actually do this a lot. If you have a, you know, PCIe by 16 port splitting up to four by four ports, you can put NVMe storage or something like that in there. That's really common. And there's just a little bio switch that lets you do it. In this system, you don't have a bio switch. Well, you kind of do have a bio switch, but the answer is that you really, that you have to switch the bios to a different version. That may not seem like a big deal, but it just takes a little bit of extra time. I wish that it was just a simple bio switch that you could just hit a little setting that said, okay, do you want it to be by four or four by ones? That would be a little bit easier, but you know, these are really inexpensive boards. So I guess that's just kind of how it is. So let's talk about OS compatibility because that really, I think has a really close tie-in with the NIC situation here. So these use the Realtek 8125B NICs or RTL 8125B NICs. So the other really interesting thing is just how Realtek does their NICs. They actually have either the, you know, you go in as one gig Ethernet, then you either have USB and that's one chip or you have PCIe, which is a different chip. And so realistically, that's how Realtek fills out the market. And they really focus on the Windows desktop market because they're really inexpensive. So when we did our OS testing, Windows worked great. You basically get Windows 10, you install it, everything works and you're off to the races. Something you should note is just the fact that like everything, if you are using the Windows default drivers, they're probably not as good as going and getting the most recent driver. So I would definitely suggest that the out-of-box Realtek driver is, I guess, okay, but there are newer versions that you can just go download. Now, if you go to the hard kernel site, you're going to see that it says Ubuntu Linux compatibility, and it kind of does have compatibility. I mean, this is an x86 platform. The Gemini Lake, Gemini Lake Refresh Atom series have been around for a long time. And so it's not necessarily one of those platforms that, you know, is kind of like a really niche or low volume platform. I think they actually sell a lot of these things into some markets. So it's pretty well supported in Windows, but in Linux, it's basically not as well supported when we get to the NIC side. Specifically, the Realtek NICs, if you install Ubuntu Linux, you're not going to have a Realtek 2.5 gig Ethernet NIC coming out of like 20.04 LTS. You're just not going to have that NIC work out of box. There are .deb packages that you can just download and install pretty easily and get working, but that also means that to get it working with a NIC in something like Ubuntu, you actually need to go and have some way to get the driver on there because you don't have a, you have six of the same NICs and all the, all of them use the same driver and that driver isn't present or doesn't work. Well, then how do you get a driver onto something like this? Of course, if you're sitting next to this box, you can just go put a USB stick in and transfer it that way. 
You can go use something like a Wi-Fi NIC. You can go use a USB NIC or something like that. And then you just basically take, get the driver, just download it, install it, and you're ready to go. A little lab tool that I have is I have a little, this is, I think, a, a Sabrent. Uh, it's called the NT USB 2.0. It's a USB 2.0 adapter. That's a 10-100 adapter. It is not fast, but it basically works in just about everything. And I actually use this to go and download drivers and install stuff when we hit these kind of situations. While everything else will work out of the box, you do need to get that driver for the NICs. And when you have six NICs, it's kind of a bummer to even have to go do that. Along the same lines in Debian distributions, we looked at Proxmox. Proxmox, same thing, where basically you would install it, the NICs wouldn't show up. So you go and you install the driver, you can do the .deb package or however, you, you know, there's repos that have it and whatever you want to go do. But you just basically go and you install the driver and everything works. And all of a sudden you have a virtualization solution with six two and a half gig ethernet NICs. Now we're doing this video just before PFSense 2.5 comes out and they will have a package for, I think, Realtek NICs. And so we downloaded the latest development version of it. And the problem that we ran into was basically the same thing where it wasn't supported out of the box. I know there are a lot of people that are going to see something and say like, oh my gosh, there are six two and a half gig Ethernet NICs. I want to go make a, you know, PFSense firewall on it, or I want to go, you know, build a, a virtual switch or something like that on, on a system like this. Frankly, Realtek has pretty good Windows or, you know, very serviceable Windows support. They have, you know, I guess, okay Linux support. And at some point, that's not going to be an issue. We're going to have to go install the driver. My guess is that it'll be, we'll have a driver that at least works somewhat out of the box um, at some point, but that's just not there right now. And then FreeBSD, I just uh, frankly don't think that Realtek really cares about the FreeBSD market. And that's kind of, you know, a statement on the broader hardware market as well. I think that most people, you know, they'll support either Linux or Windows first, probably the other one second. They might support VMware at some point. But by the time you get to FreeBSD, there's just not as great a hardware support. And that's just kind of something that's, you know, we see all the time. My big challenge with a FreeBSD firewall that you have to go install like an extra NIC just to be able to download the right package or driver or whatever to be able to go and run the thing correctly. I just don't like that because if ever an update break something or anything happens, you're basically stuck without a network connection, not just for this device, but potentially for, you know, all of these systems that sit behind it. I completely realize that there are a lot of people on YouTube that are perfectly okay with that. They're like, hey, I'm going to use this at home. I don't really care. Or maybe it's a small business. I don't really care if that happens. But I will tell you a little quick story, which is if you're on the road on a business trip and your network breaks down because something got messed up on an update, what you can run into an issue is that you can't remote in to be able to go fix it and you have to go guide whoever's there on the phone. And that person is most likely very unhappy with the fact that your job was to run the network and it is not working. So for anything like a firewall appliance, I tend to always be very conservative with the hardware that I spec for it because I don't ever want to run into that. And frankly, using Intel NICs, you just don't run into that issue in FreeBSD. They just work pretty well. So this ends up being a case of, well, you can get it working. You're going to have to go through some extra steps and you're probably not going to sleep as well at night knowing that if it does, if you do go through and have an upgrade or anything weird happens, it's not going to be a super straightforward process to get internet access again. Again, I know there are a lot of people out here that just do not subscribe to that, but that's okay. I'm just giving you a point of view. The other weak point to this hardware package, I think is really this case. Now I left the stickers on this case because I just thought it was kind of fun that this had this like kind of really fancy design on, on the uh, plastic film that's on the outside. But basically this is an acrylic case. And the reason that I have these systems over here is let's take a look at this one. This is the Lenovo M90 NIOT. And if you look at this unit, this is a really like, it's a good metal case, has some nice passive cooling. They even thought of like, hey, let's go put a, let's go put a little plastic bit here so you don't burn yourself. And this, you know, I purchased this for $200 from Lenovo, came with a keyboard, it came with a mouse, a power adapter, and, you know, came with RAM and all that kind of stuff as well. So I actually think that this was a pretty good package, but the case on this is just really nice. Below that, we have a Dell and Project Tiny Mini Micro node. And whether it's from Dell, HP, or Lenovo, these one liter systems are probably not feeling as solid as this thing, as this Lenovo IoT unit. But at the same time, they are pretty nice. They're all metal designs or mostly metal designs, and they feel pretty sturdy. 
This unit is basically held together by some kind of interlocking things. You have to go put in three and a half inch hard drives on the bottom of it to keep it secure. Now, of course, these guys offer different cases, but it just kind of speaks to the fact that like you, know, you end up with this like kind of plasticky case thing that is kind of put together. And it's actually really cool that somebody came up with it, but it's a completely different level of fit and finish and polish than something that is mass produced these. And frankly, if you were on a hike and you had a mountain lion that was in front of you and you had either this little Lenovo unit or you had one of these units with this plastic case, frankly, this unit you would throw at the mountain lion in self-defense and you would feel like maybe you had a potential chance. You probably wouldn't. The mountain lion would probably just, you know, not even care and still eat you anyway. But at least you would feel like you're a little bit better off and maybe you put up a fight. If you threw this case at the mountain lion, there's a good chance that it would just fall apart in the air and it would never even hit the mountain lion. That's a little bit of a roundabout story, but basically my point is that a board like this, you kind of need to have a nice case so it's more deployable. And these cases are just, they're okay and they're cheap, but they're not nice. And I totally get the fact that the whole purpose of this is really to be inexpensive and to be kind of more of a maker project. I get it, but it just kind of feels like if you want to use something that this kind of feels like a little bit of a higher end solution, I feel like a little bit higher end solution, you kind of need to have a little bit higher end of a case option. All right, so let's talk about performance. And I'm just going to kind of give some just kind of general ideas. Does this work as a desktop? Yeah, sure, it's fine. It's not necessarily anywhere near as fast as a new M1 Mac mini or basically any other systems that we test. This is definitely one of the slower systems that we test on a scale. So we don't really actually have great comparison data. If I were going to compare this to systems that we've tested, I would probably look to something like an Intel Atom 27 58 or something that was like an eight core older Atom generation from like 2013, which people still use in a lot of network devices and low cost devices. This does have a GPU, which is a little bit different. And that is kind of nice. When we look at something like the Core i3 8145U that's in this Lenovo unit over here, this thing is probably going to be at least, even though it's a two core four thread option, because it is the bigger cores, it's going to be about 50% or so faster. You also get better single thread performance on this because you have higher clocks. Power consumption was definitely a strong point. So we got about five watts or so at idle. I think the official spec sheet said four or about four, and that seems about reasonable. By the time we added the H2 net card, we had an SSD and stuff like that, we were getting idle more in maybe the seven-ish watt range, which is still very reasonable. In terms of maximum power consumption, this thing actually used under 20 watts when we just were using the CPU and NICs and stuff like that. However, if you do use the GPU, you are gonna go a little over 20 watts. And that's definitely when I would think about using a fan because you do see power consumption go a little bit higher when you start stressing the GPU as well as the CPU. Then again, on a system like this, I don't necessarily think that you're gonna be running at 100% or you'd wanna run at 100% CPU utilization often. So if you're running really in that kind of, you just need compute, but you don't necessarily need a ton of performance, maybe you just need memory and network, then this is actually kind of an interesting option because you can run this thing passive, especially if you're keeping the, you know, basically closer to idle or 30, 40, 50%, maybe like that, you're probably going to be able to run this thing passively with just this heatsink as long as you have enough, you kind of guess, ambient airflow. Well, you can run all of the six two and a half gig NICs at their basically full speeds. This is not a replacement for a switch and don't let anybody tell you that you couldn't use this as a full speed switch behind it. it. At the end of the day, it's a whole bunch of PCIe by one gen two, you know, NICs that are going into a low power SOC. You're not gonna be able to do things like have six two and a half gig IPsec VPN tunnels going off all things. You're just never going to be able to do that on something like this. So you kind of have to temper your expectations. A really cool use case that a reader actually brought to me and why I got this unit, I guess, in the first place was that the idea is that a lot of the new wireless APs are two and a half gigabit ethernet because as Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E become more common, you get more bandwidth. And so you need that faster than one gigabit backhaul to be able to keep up with the wireless radios. So the reason that he was interested in this was he said, well, look, I can go virtualize and put a captive portal system for my clients that need, you know, to have just general public folks come in and, you know, we can totally segment that on a different NIC and just call it a totally different network. And I actually put the two and a half gig uh, ethernet ports directly into this unit. I don't even need to go get a switch. So it actually saves me a lot of money. And then some of the other ports could be used for the internal networks and all that kind of stuff. You can have an IOT network and have a dedicated NIC to that. And I thought that was actually a really interesting use case for something like that. So I just kind of wanted to try it myself and it worked out okay. Overall, I think if you're looking for something that you want CPU performance, getting something like a Project Tiny Mini Micronode, 
at one liter used is much better. Uh, they're just faster processors. So at the end of the day, this is a low power atom processor. And that is what it is. The real techniques and being able to not just have two, but then going in and having six of them, I think is a huge differentiator. It's just kind of a bummer that they are real techniques. And at the same token, if you go and you install the driver and let's say you want to go install Proxmox, you can have six NICs all set up. And I think that's just a phenomenal setup. And under Windows, it works fine. There are definitely some things that make this feel more like a maker system rather than a mass production, like really high quality, like awesome system. And, you know, it's things like having this little floopy battery here. Also having things like these cases that are, you know, pretty questionable. You probably want to go 3D print your own or something like that. But at the same time, if you just want to go and learn how to do things clustered, like let's say you want to go have a very small Kubernetes cluster, that's a low power Kubernetes cluster, and you still want to use x86 because you want everything to be directly translatable to your servers that you have installed. Well, this actually is a really inexpensive option. And something that you get here is you get the ability to have multiple NICs that you don't necessarily get without going to USB NICs on the Project Tiny Mini Micro Node. Wow, that was a lot, wasn't it? But hey, if you like this video, one thing you can do for us is click like, click subscribe, turn on the notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new content. If you guys think that's interesting, what I am gonna do is do a couple of little just kind of personal projects around doing some kind of clustered uh, storage and clustered compute with these little nodes. And if you wanna see some of that and actually to do a video on that, let me know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.